uh, indicator for levels of uh, erosion coming from uh, coming from the watershed itself. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with the Gaius watershed, it's uh, one of three watersheds in Marito, right in between uh, Manel watershed and Toguan, about 1.7 square miles, and it discharges directly into the Cocos Lagoon and the um, Mountain Channel. Uh, it's bordered by three high mountain peaks. You have Mount Schroeder, uh, Mount Sasalaguan, and Mount Pinasanta. And um, some of the basic land cover, the, the, the um, closer to the coast, you have some developed areas, uh, mostly residential. And then along the ridge lines, it's grasslands. And then you, in the back, you'll have more uh, ravine forest. And um, some pretty steep uh, valley slopes in the back as well. So what we did is uh, we did a first watershed assessment based on site visits and uh, we did an aerial survey and we also tried to use some of the data that was currently available. Um, one of the cool things was GIS data really helped us with some of the initial watershed assessment things. Um, we also collected some field data, turbidity, rainfall, stream level, stream flow, and also soil samples from some of the representative sites in the water, within the watershed. And finally, our data analysis, which I'm gonna kind of breeze through. I'm gonna try to make it, I'm just gonna show you some of the pictures, try to give you more of a general idea of what we saw rather than get you all into what the, act, you know, the numbers and all the things that could get extra complicated with the amount of time we have. So this is uh, one of the, we took, one of the things we did was taking the GIS data available and we ran a GIS erosion model based off the revised universal soil loss equation. Uh, and that gives you an idea of what the potential soil loss would be um, for areas within the watershed. This model was actually developed by Mike Park, who was a previous grad student down um, Weary. And uh, one of the great things that came up is we have a map of the watershed that gives us an idea of where the higher potential um, er erosive spots would be. And uh, the results of this, you can see, the watershed kind of has two general sections. You have this uh, coastal portion, coastal half, which is, um, it's a little flatter. You have uh, some areas with bad lines, which you'll see in the pictures. And then the back is a little hard to get to. It's much steeper, and, but still pretty heavily vegetated. Uh, especially along the stream, and then you have some, some grasslands uh, up along the ridge. Um, so this is one kind of cool figure that we got during our watershed assessment. And we also went down into the stream, uh, went out with the mayor's boys, showed us around, um, saw some areas down by the, the road that extends into the watershed where you have some stream bank erosion. And then you can see just bamboo is also a big issue down there because as the stream bank erodes and the bamboo um, starts to, the soil gets cut up from under the bamboo and it starts to back up the bridges and the culverts and causes a lot of flooding down there. Here's an example, another example of the bamboo. Uh, this is over by the, close to the ocean, the dis discharge area um, with the, some, some pretty bound, this is after a small rainfall. And then this is an actual shot of where the discharge uh, is for the Gaius River. This was after a real rainy day. Um, the, the ocean by the, so if you're standing by the church, this is how it looks in the water. You can see this brown line here. You can actually, Cocos Island is actually right out here, but it's hard to see. So, see, the, the water does get pretty, um, pretty red after heavy rain events. And then some of the upland areas, as I was saying, it's, uh, the ravine forest is, fairly intact um, in the back valley, but up along the ridge you have these, these badlands which are really problematic and um, are known to contribute uh, a lot of erosion compared to other uh, land cover types. Uh, here's some other badlands. You see how unstable the, uh, some of the sections of these badlands might be. This probably came down during a typhoon, have some subsiding of soil. Uh, we also saw some um, bad burn areas over the course of the the year study, uh, and and these happen more often it seemed um, along the areas that were more accessible. So the first frontal half closer to the coast, 
um, the road that goes up the Pico Bridge line. Uh, this is right right along the road there. And then here's the aerial picture. This is this is actually the area that burned a little later. And then you can see how patches of badlands are scattered right along this ridge. Um, there's a little bit up here, and then you see a fire going all the way in the back. That that one's actually was probably a little harder to get to, so um, probably. Uh, that's one of those fires that who knows how it started. It's, it's probably not a cigarette, but there's no road that goes back there. Uh, so our, for field data collection, what we did is we set up a data collection station um, conveniently at a bridge, um, in, kind of in the middle of the stream here. And we set up a, a stream level logger, which gives us an idea of how the river le uh, stream level fluctuates uh, during rain events. We put in a turbidimeter which logs 15 minute um, turbidity uh, data points for as long as the batteries last, which is a good month or two, and I uh, switched that out. And then um, finally a rain gauge up the hill to give us an idea so we can correlate the data between uh, stream flow, turbidity, and rainfall. Sorry. And then finally, our, our soil sample results. Um, I'm not going to get too far into it, but uh, what we did was we tried to um, pick locations. So we sampled at some badlands, at some badlands, and within the ravine valley itself. And um, the results showed that, um, as expected, badlands, the organic matter, and pH, things that make it easier for plants to grow in that area, was, uh, was limiting. And then, whereas if you see parts of the ravine forest section. Um, but all in all, the, the soil in the watershed is really difficult to use for agriculture and, and things that would help manage the area. So the plants, kind of big picture idea, the plants that are currently growing there are probably more adapted for those conditions. And here's how the data look, all in all, when you can see spikes, so this is a, this spike here is the July, what was it? Tropical storm how long um, event and you can see this so this is going to be uh, rainfall up top and stream level on the bottom here you see how stream level um, increases with rainfall and the watershed was actually found to be very dynamic um, here the here's just compared with turbidity and turbidity correlates uh, very closely with stream level so we have turbidity here on the bottom from our turbidimeter and rainfall on the top here. Um, this, so these, I don't know if you guys can see these green dots here were actually, um, this was taken from my handout turbidity meter and um, one cool thing is using a turbidity meter, which is out there at all times of day at two in the morning when it turns out the heaviest rains come was very nice to have because when I go out there during the safe conditions when it was just raining just enough, um, this is what kind of readings I get. So my data would be skewed if, if we're just relying on um, my handheld to reading readings. So some of our highest levels were uh, uh, almost 1,000 NTUs. I don't know if that number means so much right now, but um, we can get an idea. So here's a, this is kind of on a, on a uh, kind of zoom in on that chart and you can see how dynamic the watershed is. So if you look at this single day here, um, within, so this is going to be each line here is about six hours, so within a few hours, the stream level can more than double and come back down. So a very dynamic watershed of heavy rainfalls um, can cause situations like this. This is where, right off a bridge, um, where we collect our data. This is how it normally looks, and this is how it looked um, during tropical storm, how long the water line was almost up to the bridge. I believe that's about five, four or five feet as opposed to a fraction of a foot. Um, here's some more. So as far as our um, analysis, we identified some sources of erosion. On uh, the lower areas, we have stream bank erosion, which occurs during the heavy rainfalls. And then um, here's a situation where uh, we have some, uh, we have a little tributary here that, that runs only when it rains enough. And um, so one thing I noticed was there's a little plume coming out from here into the, the normal 